Hey there, good evening. I'm Lisa Ann and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who's celebrating victory over a drug and alcohol addiction, an anxiety disorder, and many, many different patterns of codependency. I'm very excited to be here with you tonight to walk through this lesson and we will begin step five and lesson 12 on confess. So, step five. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. And the scripture that goes with that is, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now, joining that step is our topic for tonight, which is confess. And I like to call it the courage to confess because it takes a lot of courage to be able to confess. Now recapping where we just came from so we can move into step five would be we just finished step four, which was writing out our personal inventory of all of our resentments and our fears and our sinfulness, our secrets and the things that we've been holding in so long. So we will be taking that and we will be approaching a very courageous act of confessing that and handing that over to our higher power who we choose to call Jesus Christ. Now I would like to make a note that my personal experience with all of these steps is that they're all my favorite but this one is my favorite favorite because I have experienced such a tremendous amount of freedom and security from being able to live out step five. And confession is part of almost all of the steps, but part five, step five is where we, we confess the scary, very dark secrets that we need to get off of us and get out of us. So what I would like to remind us is that this is a we program. Every one of our 12 steps begins with we, we. We are not alone. We do not do this alone. We do not remove the shame and the guilt and all of the pain. We confess it to ourselves and God and another human being. So moving forward with the lesson, we're going to take a look at the word confess and we're going to use an acrostic and walk through what confession really looks like and the benefits of that. So, here we go. It, and in that, I, I wanted to note that while we're moving forward into this step, we have located and connected to a trusted sponsor, a trusted pastor or spiritual mentor of some sort. Um, some people have even used a counselor if they if they didn't have the opportunity to connect with another person in recovery whom they could trust. So I can't express the importance of finding a person who will make time for you and give you some good orderly direction. And before I move forward into what confessing looks like, I, I would like to share that the way we get out our papers that we wrote all of our heart on and we share it we can do it any way that we would like to. There's freedom in how we share and we read out all of those things that we wrote. And your sponsor may make a, a suggestion or allow you to make a suggestion. Would you like to find a quiet place in a park? Would you like to meet at their house or yours if it's a safe and private place? Personally, I went with somebody to the beach and found a private corner where they were able to read out the things that they wrote and write some of their confessions on balloons and release it up into the air. That was their spiritual act to let it go to God. So there's, there's many different ways you can go about it. There's no right or wrong way. The only right way is to just do it. So I'll be praying for everybody who's at this step and ready to move forward. Okay, so the first letter in the word confess is C, and it says to confess your shortcomings and resentments and fears and sins to yourself, to God, and to somebody you trust. 
So we've confessed it to ourselves and got on our paper and step five is allowing us to confess that to another human being. So this, at this stage we are out of a lot of our denial. We've faced a lot of our denial in the first four steps and we've, we've come out of hiding and we are more aware of the things that we've been holding in. So once we begin to share that and confess that over to another human being, we will receive more awareness and less denial. There will be even more to come up and come out of us while we are sharing the things that we have already come out of denial about. So that's very exciting. It's not a one and done. It's not a rushed thing. It is between you and God and the person who you decided to trust and it's a very freeing experience. So what we're doing when we decide to confess is we are coming into agreement with the suggestions of a 12-step program that have worked for hundreds of thousands of people and we are also coming into agreement with God's Word and I did a little bit of studying. I'm a little new in this area, but I wanted to just get a better, deeper understanding of the word confess. And I will try to pronounce this word correctly. It is homologio. And it's a, another word for confess in the Greek language. And I found it very heartfelt that this means to voice the same conclusion to come into full agreement and align with God because he knows us. And to me, that, that is such a beautiful thing that God already knows us. Um, he's, just, he's just waiting on us to come into agreement with him. And that's what the word confess means. He's already there and he would like to invite us in. So he's not going to be surprised and he's not going to be ready to put the hammer down on us. He's actually ready to remove the hammer that is already hitting us in our head, in our heart, so to speak. Um, a scripture that is that goes with that would be Psalms 139. You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. And that's very comforting to know that the Bible is telling the truth. So we move on to the next letter in the word confess, which is O, and that is spelled out for us, obey God's direction. So this was a big problem for me, and I was very panicked and nervous that I had to do some kind of extreme fasting and praying and asking tons of people about God's direction for me. And how could I possibly hear him? And, and all of the panic and the doubt that comes with obeying God's direction. See, obeying God's direction doesn't just stop at being willing to. It also brings up the question of how do I and how do I know what his direction is? And I can just give my own experience that if he brought me to a 12-step program and he brought me to a group of people who have already experienced these freedoms, then I am heading in the right direction. So I hope that you also have come to that conclusion and it will make the process of obeying much smoother for you and for me continuously. So God pretty much gave us direction when he told us what to do in the scripture and the fifth step of admitting to ourselves and to him and to another human being. So we've, we realize that's our next directive and we've taken steps to get towards that. We've taken a look at ourselves. We've, you know, asked for his direction and we've reached out to a sponsor or a trusted servant so that we can move forward and obey what the Word of God directs us to do. And the thing that I find uh, it's cheerful to me is when I look at the word God and I give that an acrostic, it can simply stand for good orderly direction. And He is a God of order and He is not the author of confusion. So we in our natural state and dealing with all of life on life's terms become confused and 
make things complicated. And that's why good orderly direction in these steps help walk us through. And his word is there every step of the way to back up each and every one of these 12 steps. And I'm very grateful for that. So I will, I will share this scripture that gives us another direction and he, he he gives a lot of directions when he says to become willing and to come and talk this over and to pray for one another and to share openly we have plenty of direction right there in front of us if we are able to stick with the here and now and focus on each one of these steps and that brought a lot of peace to me because I had a tendency to want to look far into the future and, and get myself really tripped up so the scripture that brought so much peace to me, and a lot of us find different scriptures to be very encouraging, and they're all very, very good, but once in a while we, we run into a specific scripture in the Word of God that just really hits us personally, and this one was the one for me. It brought me a lot of comfort, and that would be Isaiah 118, and it says, Come, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And it goes on to talk about how deep this, the stain of our sin is. And at the end it says, If you are willing, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. So to me, he gives a little more direction. He says, Come. And then he asks us to be willing and step five takes a lot of willingness and it takes a lot of courage and I believe in you and I believe it for myself it's not a theory it's very well tested and lived out by many 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 Christians and other people in 12-step programs who have followed this good orderly direction and they are years of years of sanity restored to them so that would be my prayer for myself and all of you and then moving on to the next letter in the word confess would be n and that reads out as no more guilt and that is one of my favorite parts even though they're all my favorite parts that's one of my highest favorite because the guilt in my life I could spend hours sharing my testimonies of what the shame and guilt in my life propelled me to do. You know, I don't blame anything or anybody today, but I take responsibility for me. But now doing these steps, realizing the character defects and my shortcomings and guilt and shame were, were one of them. And they were very powerful in my life. And one of the scriptures that I found pertaining to coming clean and being released of all of the guilt is in Proverbs, and it's Proverbs 17, 22, and it says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And I've tried a lot of medications, folks, of all different sorts. Of I tried medicating myself with people, places, and things, and substances, and my bones were brittle and dry, and I surely was broken. So I know that no more guilt is a true experience for me in my life and I'm very grateful for it and I, I pray the same for you and I took a few notes on the no more guilt thing when we come clean to ourselves it might be easier to admit it to ourselves and God in the privacy and that's where we did that in step four but step five when we add another human being into the mix what it does is well, for me, admitting things to myself gave me a little bit of hope, a little bit of self-appraisal, a little bit of, okay, you're, you're moving in the right direction, you're not in denial. But, oh, when I added another person into my confession between me and God, it broke me into a new state of humility, which I didn't even know what the word humility really meant. But I know that I've experienced it now, and I have less of an isolated mindset, less of a I'm so different and I'm so unique or my hurts, habits and hangups are so far-fetched than other people's or oh they're really not that big of a deal, they're not that bad so I don't even know if I qualify for this program. I just 
took the cotton out of my ears and put it in my mouth for a couple of weeks and listened to some of these amazing men and women who have done what this good orderly direction says and I'm telling you that was the best medicine that I could take because I I don't I don't have that gnawing guilt. I'm always trying to hide something or work my way around something or overly work to make up for stuff I've done in my past or overly take care of people because I feel so guilty from the things I didn't take care of or the things my parents didn't do that I'm trying to make up for that. That's what guilt and shame does to me. It, it fuels my codependency issues and that's a whole nother topic but I, I wanted to tie that in because guilt is a sin in itself because it blocks us from the sunlight of the Spirit of God and sin is not just the bad things we've done and said it is the things that are embedded in us that this fifth step digs out and it can be a little bit scary and again that's why we we have courage we we don't have courage but we have just enough courage by hearing other people share that we we borrow some of their courage and we're able to walk forward into the those moments of confession so the next letter in the word confess is face the truth well my truth and everybody else's truth was always a little bit distance you know and so Something that the book said that I appreciated was the con is over and we begin to fess up and now we can face any truths. So they broke the word down a little bit. We're not we're not we're no longer con artists and we can now fess up to the hurts, habits and hang ups and the resentments and the fears and the anxieties and the, all of the worries and the misdeeds and we can face it open mindedly and with a little less fear. I wouldn't go straight into no fear at all because that's not where some of us are. And I am still doing things today with a little bit of fear, but I'm able to face it just like standing here in front of this camera. I can talk to a group of people in a meeting without a problem, but put a camera or any kind of lights or any of that and it's like, whoa, mm -mm. I, I had to show up and I had to confess that I was afraid and let somebody else pray for me so that I could go through with this. So I w we're able to face things when we're not being conned. When we're not being conned by the enemy of our soul and we are not conning ourselves with you know, lying, cheating, and stealing, and manipulating, and trying to hide and cover things up, that is all, uh, that is all con. We, that's what we do when we're conning others and we're, we're being conned ourselves by our hurts in there. So it's very enlightening when we're able to face the truth and the, there, there was a couple positive truths other than all of the scarier truths that we have to take a look at with our behaviors and our patterns and why we do the things we do. And a few of those positive truths were we face the truth that there is a God and that we are not Him. And I don't know about anybody else, but that was great news to me because I was in denial over the fact that I was so for so long trying to play God's role. And I knew He was real, but I didn't know the difference between His role and my role. And thank God today, by the grace of Jesus Christ, that I now know the difference. And anytime I venture off over into trying to play his role, I get quickly reminded how much of a disaster that will be. So we can face the, that truth that there is a God and we are not him, but he is real in our lives. And Jesus Christ is a gracious Lord and Savior. And the truth that we matter to him and that he does help us recover is very tangible in my life right now where I wouldn't be standing here being open and honest. So that goes to our next letter which is E for ease the pain. So in easing the pain just like the scripture says a merry heart does a body good. When, when we have less pain and, and less tension, it's a little easier to face the truths. So we go into f 
to face the truth with a lot of fear and a, a lot of pain and all of that bottled up and boiling up and we take these little steps and we start getting a little relief we got a little relief through steps one two and three we got a little relief through step four of writing all that out and getting it out on paper and maybe even sharing a little bit each week in our step studies or our, our open share groups but then comes the big open honest confession of all resentments hurts hang-ups patterns and the amount of pain that is lifted off of me resulted in no more drinking, no more blackout drinking, no more drug binges, way less codependency patterns, and lots more healthy boundaries of how to serve God in a healthy way and be a Christian who puts others first, but not be so sick and so caught up on doing more, 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 more that I really enable other people and hinder their walk with Christ. Um, the pain being eased off me also looks like way less anxiety and panic way less anger and frustration and much more tolerance continuously tapping into these steps to pull out more tolerance and to to give away more of the pain and i mean you could, you could go on and on for hours about how being able to release the heavy burden off you brings so much ease and so much less pain and there are many very intimate details when you share with your sponsor that you may not necessarily share on camera or in a big open share group it's your choice but some of the small I mean some of the deep and dark secrets and the pain th painful things that happened to us in childhood those are very personal and very vulnerable moments that we share with a trusted person in God or our counselor or our, our pastor. And that alone can bring relief from the pain of childhood in many different areas. And it's way too much to go into, but I will briefly state that I had a gnawing, agonizing hatred and just mounds of anger towards my father, my my earthly father that I was in so much denial over the fact that it was really a hurt sad broken little girl who as an adult woman acted rude and cocky and arrogant and very mouthy and disrespectful to him so the pain of that that is just a small example was lifted off of me and I'm very grateful for that so Boom, moving right along to the next letter, which would be stop the blame. Oh my goodness, it's everybody else's fault but mine. That's just a little joke because a lot of our hurts and hang-ups do have to do with the way other people have treated us and guided us in our lives, and that is not something to joke around about. However, in this step, we are here to focus on getting the relief and the healing that we need for our inner hurts so that we can work past those hurtful relationships in a proper way. And stopping the blame is an understanding where we no longer put the blame on other people and make excuses but we realize that we can take responsibility for ourselves right in the moment and there's a very big difference this inventory and this sharing and confessing is to be focused on the wrongs that i have done or the wrongs that i hold inside of me and later on down the line is when the amends process will start to take place where you work through some of the, the, the sad and scary things that people have done to us, whether they knew it or they didn't know it. So right now just ma mainly focusing on what we have done so that we can take a look at ourselves and we will have the courage to ask God's forgiveness so that we can receive forgiveness enough to give to those who have hurt us. So I found it easier for me to take a look at all of my sinfulness and darkness and ugliness, no matter who participated in it, so that I could find the desperation to say, okay, Jesus, I surrender. I am a sick person 
not necessarily a bad person, but a very sick person. And I would like to be a lot less sick so I can forgive those in my childhood or forgive those jobs or whatever it is that I need or whoever it is that we need to forgive. It's, it's more enjoyable to be able to extend forgiveness to them when we realize how much forgiveness we really need and the joy, the joy, the joy that comes from the forgiveness that we feel. There's no scientific explanation and I can't do this with a bunch of points for you. All I can say is that it is a spiritual, supernatural experience and he gave us some tangible, good, orderly, directive steps that when they meet together, the joy that comes out is it, it propels, it has propelled me and hopefully you as well into releasing forgiveness to a lot of the things that we just say, you know what, no matter who is right or wrong, I want to be free today. So one of the benefits of stopping the blame is stopping the torturing insanity and the grudgeful thoughts. There is an old saying and it goes, to live is to be free of anger because the grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. And when I really thought about that, it was mostly pertaining to some alcoholics who were trying to recover, but it really flows out into anybody who would like to grab a hold of that because if I am a if I'm grouchy and irritable and resentful and angry, no matter the reason, no matter the real hurt that has happened, plus all of the things I've done that have added guilt and shame, it's not a matter if any of that is real or not real. It is a matter of the insanity that happens within my brain where I obsessively think about that person, place, or thing, or situation that didn't go right, didn't go my way, didn't go God's way, because I know God, you know, I know what God would want. In the midst of all that sanity, no, I did not know what God would want. So when I stopped blaming and I took a look at my own actions and thoughts, not just the actions that we're taking a look at in step five, it's the thinking patterns and the thoughts, that obsessiveness of what a shoulda, coulda. A, a grouch and a brainstorm is not going to result in a kind, Christian, freeing manner. It is going to result in anger, anger, frustration, wrath, and constant trying to fill that void and quiet those voices with our own remedies that never worked, you know? So it's just very liberating to know that when I confess my anger, a soothing comes along that lasts much longer than a joint or a beer, just keeping it real. It is a permanent and ever present. It's always available to tap back into and say, I feel this offense. I feel this anger. This is the situation. This is what I've said in it and done in it. This was my reaction. This is what it caused me to feel like. All of those things that we wrote out in our fourth step are the things that we will be stopping the blame and confessing over to God. And that leads us to our last letter, which is also S again. And that is start accepting God's forgiveness. And the question is, what are we actually expecting to receive from step five? And I would say through my experience that we are, we can expect to get rid of that terrible sense of isolation and have more of a sense of belonging. We can expect to feel the presence of God, which is peace and calmness, a little bit more calmness, and all of the fears and the insecurities, they start to get smaller and because God becomes bigger inside of us because we made room for Him 
You know, we made room for him. We invited him in. We were accepting God's gift to us when we say, come on in. Isn't that so absurd and ridiculous sounding that the God of the universe that most of us have heard is a really scary, mean person because he says what he wants and that's the bottom line, that all he wants from us is to bring him our ugliness? Like, no makeup or nothing. I didn't even have to put eyeliner on or put a, a summer dress on today. I could have came in anything I wanted and he doesn't care. He wants our hearts just the way they are. And it's beautiful and it's very non-religious. I'm very grateful for religious people who have helped me learn the Bible and how to read it and understand it. And I'm also very grateful for spiritual programs like the 12 steps and the fact that I knew God was real, but I didn't even know he cared that much. I didn't know he cared about me personally and that he cared. I knew he cared about everybody else personally, but I couldn't accept it for my own self. And part of accepting God's forgiveness is obeying his good orderly direction. I am scared to confess all of this stuff to somebody. That's a confession. That's the first step to a confession it, when you meet with your sponsor. Like, I know, I rescheduled mine about six times with my sponsor. And finally, she thankfully said, all you have to do is confess to me that you're scared and we would be able to move forward. Like, let's still go to a meeting and grab a cup of coffee then and then and we'll, we'll work through some of that fear. But instead I just hid and, and I wanted to, try to not go through with it because I felt better anyways you know I, I felt better but my best feelings always lead me back to another drink or a drug or a person who I can try to overly please so I had to stop going on my feelings and I had to suit up and show up to a gracious God who died to give me life and I would like to end with just a little something that I wrote down regarding our journey continuing from here. And first of all, I would like to say that from the bottom of my heart, I thank God that I get to know him even better. And I'm happy that he gets, that he knows me no matter what it looks like. So. What I have experienced, it is very true that faith is what pleases the Lord. It's all through the Bible. There's many stories of it. I didn't pull an actual story out because the story I'm sharing is part of my own story. That faith is what pleases the Lord. And part of obedience is using our faith. It would be good if we did everything exactly the way we know we should. However, our tendencies to do the wrong things often get in the way, but our faith alone will continue to please God. Not our immature, um, con artist, actress ways of trying to make ourselves look good in front of him, but our faith. And what I mean by that in closing is stepping out on the faith that I borrowed from another recovering person is the very courage it gave me the very courage that it allowed me to become free see i didn't have enough i didn't i couldn't locate my faith on my own to be able to please god i took some good orderly direction from the program and from another recovering alcoholic who is also a grateful believer in jesus christ and i borrowed theirs i borrowed their 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 carpet of courage and when i did that i was able to fess up and, and experience some freedom. And each time that I freeze with guilt or shame, even in the times when I know that I am guilty, I jump back onto that carpet of courage and push off into God's love. And when I do that, we show God that we accept his forgiveness and his love. And the messiness of the messiness we just get back on that carpet of courage and fall right before him. We enter his, you know, his presence with 
here I am, Lord. Here I am. And that, my friends, is the courage to confess. There's, there's nothing else involved in it. There's no magic carpet. There's a carpet of courage that I borrowed from another person in recovery because they were willing to open up and share with another human being their exact nature of their wrongs. So I pray for you as you move forward in your steps, and I encourage you to wholeheartedly, thoroughly, rigorously honest actions only even if you have to start over each day. Thank you for letting me share. God bless you.